and welcome to Vista Talks, interesting discussions with interesting people from all around the world. I'm your host for today, Maria Roa, and I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Simon Moore. Simon is a chartered business and consumer psychologist and CEO with the award-winning psychology strategy consultancy, Innovation Bubble. Simon and his psychology team have advised well-known global brands such as FedEx, Pfizer, Microsoft, Sony, Aviva, Ericsson, Sony Music, Virgin Atlantic, and Bupa in relation to understanding human decision-making, behavior, and decisions. Dr. Simon Moore is also an author and regularly presents an international conf at international conferences on employing psychological science to help brands develop a stronger employee consumer understanding and brand relevance. Simon enjoys inspiring and challenging audience into new ways of thinking and has acted as an advisor to the UK and US governments. He regularly appears on the TV and radio and in the press discussing organizational brand psychology and behavioral interventions. Simon, you're very welcome to the show. Hi Maria, thanks for inviting me. Hopefully everyone's still awake after that kind of um, introduction. God, that, was, that was a... a I kind of thought, God, I, I, I can't remember doing all that stuff, but I must have done it somewhere along the line. <laughs> you have, you have. I checked everything before I said it, so you have done all I that. I must have done then. Good. Yes, you did. Well, let's move on because there are many things, as you already said, and I would like to discuss today with you today some of them. So let's go on. First of all, I would like our audience to know you a bit better. So tell us about yourself. How did you get into psychology? Were you always interested in the human brain? No. <laughs> <laughs> really? I'll, I'll expand on that. Yes. And that's not a good answer is to say no. So uh, originally, this is actually funny. I was thinking about this. Um, I wanted to be... Uh, when I got past my moment of trying to be an astronaut, I wanted to, I wanted, yeah, that wasn't going anywhere. And then I wanted to work in the police force, okay. but then, but then kind of moved sideways to that, to sort of drug enforcement. And that's kind of where maybe the sort of the spark of interest in human behavior was. So I was really interested in, you know, why were, so many people having so many problems with you know substance abuse kind of drugs in general and I kind of thought I could help there mm. and I I did my A-levels in England so we do A-levels when sort of just before university and I was meant to actually do ancient history which sounds very dry doesn't it so and I missed the grade by about five points and then I went into what was called, we have a system over here called clearing, which is if you don't quite get the grades that you wanted to do your original selection, you can, mm -hmm. other universities will say, actually, you didn't might, you might not have made, you know, math and science or history, but for us, you've made the grade and you're good enough to kind of come in and do another subject. And I just went down the list, the alphabetical list, and there was this, there was this term called psychology on there. And I thought that sounds interesting. And I kind of quickly looked it up and thought, hmm, that's could, could, could possibly do that. And then that was it. And kind of went with it. And luckily for me, kind of gelled with it and it seemed to suit me. And I did I sort of excelled at it at university, um, despite the fact that it's got lots of maths in it and statistics and it's quite biological, um, which probably a lot of people are not familiar with. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that's kind of where I got to really. So yeah, it was a bit of a weird journey. And, yeah, I, and I know it would be very neat when I think people like neat stories where I'd say, yes, I, I was inspired by Freud and I, you know, and <laughs> I, I, at seven, I, you know, I bought my first couch and notebook and uh, would analyze my family. No, it didn't work that way at all. It, it, it was very side sideways how I kind of got into it. Yeah, I think we need a psychologist to study your journey, actually. Yeah, I, I don't think we should open police, that one. No, <laughs> astronaut, police, you know, then history, then the alphabetical order, you had to go all the way down to psychology, which is start with P. Yeah, we need to study all that. I mean, yes. But well, it shows you that I'm not lazy because I could have gone for you know, accounting. Yes, I, mean, I bet there were a few letters. I'm glad I didn't. Yes. 
Hmm. Okay, so uh, how do you think psychology can serve businesses and work to create more engagement, impact, and differentiate their clients with their industries? Can you give us any type of challenges or tax tasks that companies usually come to ask you for help? Yes, so uh, this is interesting. So, I mean, companies collect a lot of data. Yeah. And they're probably data saturated. So if you talk to many kind of executives in a business, I mean, they've got two audiences. They've got obviously the internal audience and the external audience. So they've got the employees and the customers. Actually, if, if you could get them aside in a secret place like the lift or on the stairwell and you ask them, what mm -hmm. is it that keeps them awake at night? If you, what, what the, the unifying answer is uni usually, why do people do things? So why do my employees leave? Why do my employees demand a pay rise when they haven't met their objectives? Why, why do my customers say one thing and do another? So they have lots of data on the how and the what's but they struggle in knowing why people do stuff. So I had a conversation last week and one of my clients summed it up really nicely and said, most businesses have very clear views, but it's a real rear view mirror view. So I'm looking behind me. So the data is telling me what happened. Mm -hmm. It's not telling me why it happened. Why? Yes. And it's not telling me what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. So I think, I'm not saying data that they collect is not helpful. Um, I'm saying that the psychology can augment what you do. So, and the other thing possibly I should say is that humans are pretty terrible, me included as a psychologist, <laughs> that we don't really understand why we make our decisions. We've got egos that we manage. So we'd probably bend the truth a little bit sometimes. Um, so getting clean data is actually quite difficult and you won't get it through, you know, questionnaires and interviews in the traditional sense. You, you do need people who know a little bit more about human behavior and how the mind works to give you that clean data, which you then can use and move yourself away from assumptions, which we're probably getting to, into questions that are going to happen that you're going to ask me, but you can see how it's linked. Most companies would be quite, some of them are honest, some of them are slightly uh, embarrassed to say that most of the work they do is based on assumption. So it's data, but I'm making assumptions about that pattern. And that's where I think, like, well, we've certainly seen how when we've moved into companies and helped them out, the dials move if you start bringing in the psychology or they move faster or they, they, they last, the effects last longer, for example. Yeah, and actually, I believe that at Innovation Bubble, you use psychological insights and methodologies to unpick many issues that business, businesses face around purchase, engagement, loyalty, et cetera. Can you let our audience know a little bit more about this and how does it work? Why is it best than these traditional methods like surveys or interviews that usually we use at businesses? Yes, yeah, so, so psychologists... To give you a little bit of a history about sort of psychologists, so that people often confuse them with psychiatrists. Um, <laughs> and the main difference is that psychiatrists earn more money. <laughs> well, and they give uh, you pills for everything. Well, uh, they, and they're they also they, prescribed yeah, they're medication. <laughs> yeah, they're interested in, you know, obviously problematic behavior at, at an individual level. Mm -hmm. uh, psychologists are sort of sideways to that. So, they are trained in both qualitative and quantitative. So they're quite, they, their statistical training is quite high. So in the three years of undergraduate, for example, they do three years of, of statistics to start with. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the fact we sit and talk to people on couches. We, we kind of look at how we data model, you know, analyze, predict. So we use probability a lot. So we would say, if I'm going to do a piece of research, what's the probability that if I repeated that a hundred times, I'm going to get the same result because then I could be more assured that that's actually real rather than me just saying, I think this is my impression, for example. So uh -huh. what we've done is we've used that skill base to build a number of tools that we think are useful to businesses to give them that level of confidence to say, look, it's not my opinion. Mathematically, we model it and predict 
and we think this is what drives your audience. This is what's important to them. This is what's not important to them. And then that allows them to go, oh, now I'm much more assured about what I need to do next. So for example, some of the tools are about segmenting people on their psychological drivers. So I don't know about you, but I've got friends who've got post-it notes all around their computer. You know, they're always looking at the time. They get irritated if people are late. They, they look at the details of stuff. Uh, and so they're planners, so they, they need control. So they're all about, I need prediction about what's going to happen. I hate it if I don't know. You know, if, if I invite you to a party and you're a planner, the questions you'll ask me is, who's going? What's it about? In other words, what's the context? What do I need to wear? What food, is there food? If it is, what is it? Yeah. So it's all, all about prediction. Why are you smiling? <laughs> because I'm, I, again, I am a mini bent planner, you know, like I'm, my, okay. yeah, yeah, well, so I that's, am that's not planner, negative, so but... that's very important for me when someone invites me to a place, I'm always like, oh, should I wear something yeah. special? You know, is it a dress code? Do I need to take something to the party? Do you need me to help you with the preparation? Do you need me to go ahead before everyone else goes to help you with it? But it's just because that's the way I'm an event organizer. So all those things are always in my head you know so yeah. yes I, but you probably mind. you probably gravitated to that role because it suits your sort of I, i'm not saying personality but it suits your your needs the fact you no, like it, planning. It does suit yeah, my yeah. personality because i do that even with like home parties or like christmas or whatever that's the way we are in my family it's within yeah. my family so i guess yeah, it's it's the way my family works is the way I learned to be and I made it my work, maybe. So yeah, probably it's but, my but that works in life. So like if you take business, let's take the car industry. If I, you know, if you think of car adverts, so this is this is how we work. So we would go in and go, okay, you have these set psychological audiences. So for example, you've got people like yourself who are planners, they're all about the detail or information. So they can predict what's going to happen. Yes. Opposite to that are people who are what we would call adventurers who are open to stuff. They're quite risk tolerant. They're not, they don't care what's going to happen next as long as it gives them something new to think about and dwell on. And it might expand their kind of information, their intelligence, their experiences. If you think about, if we know that then for the car industry, I can tell them lots of things like, okay, if you're going to create an advert, then the car advert should do two things because you've got two audiences psychologically. The car advert should do two things. For the planners, you need to show them, for example, how much space is in the boot. So yeah. how much storage. You need to show them the panel of the car where they'll be driving because they want to know how complex it is, where are all the buttons, where are the lights, where are the indicators. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's that's those kinds of examples are how you engage that audience, but that does not engage adventurers because they don't care about that stuff. So this is why you get a lot of adverts where cars are in the middle of the woods or on the beach. Yeah, because it's like new, it's out, it's an adventure, it's exciting. Yeah. That's those what they don't, want. Yeah, those don't call my attention, you're right. So, but where people get it wrong is they do one of those things. So they, you know, mm -hmm. lots of car adverts would just show you going into the mountains or stopping on the beach and getting your surfboard out and going into the kind of sea. That's only going to appeal if I was going to be cut to about 40% of your audience. Okay, so we know in the world that people are sort of grouped into four main, what we call archetypes, a little bit like personality, but it's a little bit more influential than that. These are at a very non-conscious, deep-seated level. So for example, you know, we found out that you're a planner, mostly. You I have all, I was you an have, adventurer, but I guess I'm not. Yes. But you have, you can do the other things. So sometimes you can be adventurous and some kind that's of sometimes. Sad, to, sad, sad, really <laughs> right now. It's not a bad thing. It's just the way that you'd see the world. And so <laughs> we try to help organizations, whether it's with employees or, or with their customers, see how their customers see things. So, you know, if you've got, if you're a bank or a pension fund, or an investment company, the planners will like the detail about how much is your rate of return, how much risk is there involved, what do I, how much money do I need to set aside? 
the adventurers don't want to know any of this stuff. They just want to know what's going to happen when I've done all this. Am I, am I going to be comfortable? Can I afford to be go down the road for coffee when I retire? Or am I going to have to be very careful what I do with my money? Am I allowed to take on new courses? Can I travel? So there are different messages in terms of how you place stuff. Exactly the same for your employees as well. So that's kind of one area that we look at. Another area is, and I've kind of alluded to it at the start of the conversation, that if you ask someone, you won't get accurate data back from them if you just ask what they did. And, and I've seen very kind of very artificial ways. So let, let's talk, talk about food shopping. Mm -hmm. So typically I see people, you know, if you, if you think supermarkets want to get some insight about their customers, they'll, they'll employ people to go, okay, tell me about the customer journey. And people would say, okay, so Maria, you need some bread. Tell me what happens on that journey. So what, what happens at the start and what happens at the end? And tell me everything that happens on that journey when you go and get some bread, okay? So that sounds logical because you, you do go on a journey when you get some bread. You think about it and then plan, what do I do? Where do I go? What do I need to do? How much is it going to be? And then take the bread home. The trouble is though, that people don't remember these things. So think about when you last drove a car. You probably remember getting in the car and you probably remember getting out of the car. If I asked you what happened in the middle, it becomes blurry because you're on auto, you're driving it through automation. You're not, all, which is a bit scary, isn't it? Because you're driving this big metal object at quite a fast speed. Yeah. And, you're not, and you're thinking about, oh, that's really interesting what's on the radio or what am I going to eat later for dinner or who am I going to see later today? You're not really concentrating on the road. And this is what happens with people in their day-to-day -day lives. They're so busy thinking about lots of different things that you'll never really, if, even if you're going out buying bread, you're not really <laughs> conscious about what you're doing. Yeah. So to ask them artificially, tell me from the moment you're indoors, the moment you get home about bread, what happens is people have a story in their head that they know is sensible for a bread buying experience. It's called a script. So you, you generally know what happens when you go to the cinema. You generally know what happens when you go to a bar. You generally know what happens when you go to a gym. So what happens is you, you confuse the two. You don't tell me what your experience is because you don't often remember, but you tell me what you think are the stages of a normal gym experience or a normal shopping experience, which might not be applicable actually to what's happening. So I'll give an example. We worked with a supermarket and they, they worked out that they thought their price of, I think it was bread, their price of bread was too expensive and they need to change it, the pricing and where it was in the store. And basically what we worked out was that people who were going into buying bread were so annoyed that they could not park their car easily in the car park, mm. that they were getting really, they were irritated before they went in. And so when you're irritated, you get more critical about other things. So when they went in and bought their bread, these people basically thought it was more expensive. The bread quality was poorer. They had to wait longer to queue to buy it. And when they got home, it tasted rubbish. <laughs> As opposed to the people who didn't have that experience. So there's a lot of projection there about other things in your life that you, you get muddled up with the other things in your life. So it becomes a real blend of things. It's very difficult to unpick. So that's one of the things that we do is actually try to find out what are the reality of things that are influencing it and what are people projecting that they think it makes sense or they're protecting their ego. So I'll give another example. Most people, when you ask them, would say they don't trust their bank. Okay. Yeah, which sounds sensible. A lot, we, we've heard a lot of people say, I don't trust my bank. If you actually research this and look at it that's not true most people actually at a very non-conscious level do trust their bank they say that they don't but a bank's not something that kind of pops up overnight it's a, an established institution and they've done all the rigorous checks and they're governed by a financial body what you probably trust less is your own financial ability so if i asked you where's your money invested in in your bank account you have no idea don't really know and and that's and we kind of feel a bit embarrassed by that so what we rather say is i don't trust the bank 
that deflects away from the fact that I should be, shouldn't I know where my money's invested? Shouldn't I know what interest rate I'm on? Well, no, I don't. But. So that's what we mean in the fact that what we think is sensible is not always what is reality. And so we help companies lift the rocks up and look underneath and say, is that true? Is that not true? If it's not true, why is it not true? And what do you need to do about it, for example? Yeah. No, I think you're complete. You're completely right. Sometimes we don't even know what it's behind our rational thinking, or better say, we like to think that we're rational, but yeah, or not our customers are rational. But the truth is that many times our emotions drive our decisions. Uh, yes, and that's a really good point because our, the, the way your brain works at a basic level is about a quarter of it likes numbers and facts. So 25% responds to that. 75% of your brain doesn't like numbers. It doesn't like facts. It doesn't like logic. It lives in an emotional world. It wants to feel stuff. So yeah. it, it's about feeling. Yeah. Do you think companies need to take this into consideration when thinking about decision makers, that they do really not make rational decisions and that they uh, take decisions based on emotions? Yeah, and that's and we found this to be absolutely true in uh, health. So, for example, you know there are lots of examples where people, you know, are facing very bad uh, health outcomes, even possible death, and you know the consultant will tell them this is what you need to do to stop that happening, and people still don't do it. Yeah, for example, and then. The other industry that's probably starting to recognize this is true very slowly is the financial industry. They think that everybody, just because they work and live in numbers on their day-to-day -day jobs, they think their customers do as well. So they throw numbers and logic and factual stuff at their customers and wonder why people don't stay with them, they don't buy their services, and it's because there's no emotional engagement there. I mean, think about your friends, the, the ones that give you the most enjoyment and the ones you probably trust more and the ones you want to spend more time with are the ones that fulfill you emotionally. huh? Mm -hmm. Whereas the ones who are more practical or only do one thing for you, you probably don't spend that much time and you only go to them when you really need that thing. So it's not often that you actually spend as much time with them. So brands have got to think a bit more along those lines that emotions are you know, completely outplay facts and figures as ter in terms of how people make decisions from a cognitive point of view. And that sounds, and, and they don't like the sound of that because, you know, facts and figures are easy to do, aren't they? That you just give a fact and you think you've persuaded someone. But think about when you're arguing with someone, even you can remember times when you know you're being very irrational about something, but it, you, you can't help it because it's the way you feel. You know the other person's, speaking the truth and making sense but but you won't accept it <laughs> because it's not helping you make the way you, you actually want to feel so you'll you'll do the opposite or you'll do something that the other person will consider silly but you're going well it's not silly it, i feel great because i've done it yeah but basically yeah as you we need to listen to them because that's affecting the buying cycle and the customer acquisition costs. So we do need to take into consideration that emotion drive their decisions. So yeah. So what I'm not set up. So what we what we don't do uh, we don't go into organizations and point fingers and go, oh my goodness, you're doing it wrong. What we say yeah. is the data is interesting. But if you add a psychology dimension and uh, investigate it from a psychology point of view, two things happen. One, you get more assurance that you're working with reality. Mm -hmm. Secondly, not only can we tell you what to do, and this is really interesting, we can also tell you what is a waste of budget, money and effort. And don't do it. It's not going to have any effect from a psychology point of view. And that's a conversation that's actually becoming... Uh, stronger and more common now because budget I mean obviously around the world there's a financial crisis at the moment but in general clients want to spend their money and, you know and their budgets are reduced 
and they want to spend it wisely and get as much impact from it as possible. So they don't want to always do the next new thing. Sometimes they want to say, what do I not have to do? And there's a really good reason from a psychology point of view why that's a great strategy. And that's because the human brain is much more um, bothered or engaged by negative information. Mm. Okay, so let me give an example. Uh, I'm not going to ask you if it applies to you, but in general, it applies to a lot of people. People in a relationship, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you've done some really nice things for your partner and you're feeling really smug and happy. You're in a good place. You've got lots of positive things in the bank. Your partner's happy with you, yeah? And all of a sudden, you do something that's a little bit irritating to them, yeah? Probably you don't even know what you've done, but you've irritated them nonetheless, yeah? What happens? So let's say you've done five nice things and one irritating thing. What happens? Do, do I go, okay, does my partner say, okay, one horrible thing or irritating thing you've done. So I cross that one off with this one. So now you've got four nice things left. I'm still happy with you. Does that happen? No, probably no, not. No, what happens is... You focus on the irritating thing, yes. So we don't balance it out. And that's because from an evolutionary point of view, our brains are really, really kind of uh, bothered and pay undue attention to risk. Anything that's risky and annoying and irritating is actually suggested it's threatening to us. So this is one of the things that we do with customers and say, or clients, look, don't always invent new things and try and wow people with the new thing you're gonna do. Sometimes there's actually a lot more to be said in using your money to, to remove irritating things, to remove the barriers to customer experience or customer journeys, even if that's digitally or in store, because that people are going to respond to that much more positively because they're going to go, oh, you've taken that horrible thing or that negative thing away from me. Not only are you thinking about me, but now my brain's not in a negative state because I haven't got to worry about that negative thing. I can now concentrate on the positive. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely changing in business now. Um, so that companies are not employing people to go, tell us what the next new thing to do is. I think companies now are valuing the psychology insights to go tell me what i need to do that's most effective whether that's to do some housekeeping or is is it to do the new next new shiny thing what do you think and the psychology can tell you it's almost like you know betting it will tell you where the greater odds are on creating the most positive psychology kind of experience for your employees or customers really hmm. Well, this is super interesting. We could talk for like a really long time. I, I guess I was the one who wanted to study psychology and ended up studying marketing. I don't know why, but... It, well, it's kind of related, isn't it? It is, it is. I always thought it was really interesting to know what consumers thought. So, and, and why did they bought and why did they end up buying one brand and not the other and how their brain worked. So I guess at the end I did, I did <laughs> ended up doing something similar. So, but I want to ask you something before, before we finish, because being in the localization industry, I do need to ask you, do you believe that the buyer psychology for a specific brand is the same in one country as the other? Or even when we talk about the same product, same brand, same age, gender, consumer, factors such as culture, country might change the way their brain work when buying? Really interesting question. Lots of clients ask this thing and getting a real muddle about this. So we are quite lazy when it comes to thinking about uh, people around the world. And it's easy to say uh, a particular age group only do this. So like Generation Z are different than people who've retired, for mm -hmm. example. And what we know from psychology is that's not the case in essence. So we've talked about control. There are just as many people who need control in Generation Z as there are in people who you know, reach 70 plus and retired at a psychological level. This is why I think a lot of companies get themselves in a the right mess about this sort of stuff because they, they label everything. So is it different between men and women? Is it different between age groups? Is it different between socioeconomic status? Is it different between different cultures or religions? 
So in essence, it's not. So what we find is when we do when we do a lot of research across multiple markets, we find very similar psychological triggers. However, how you then frame and communicate what you do with that with your audience then becomes different according to the market. So for example, if you talk about control, someone who's got a high level of, or high need for control in England, the way you engage with them is different than the person who's got high levels of control in Japan, for example, because there are different cultural rules, different society rules. It's not that their need is different, it's how you then meet their needs that, uh, that allow them to engage in that from their own cultural perspective, for mm -hmm. example. So there's a difference at the back end of it. So companies can actually get themselves out of whole issues of pain by stop doing these really basic, I would say pretty useless, and I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but pretty useless segmentation tools of going, oh, millennials are different than so-and-so. I've never seen that to be the case psychologically. And we've worked in you know, health, travel, retail, finance. The needs of every single age group are very similar. What you need to do to engage them in terms of how you use that understanding can be different at the other end of it. So I partly agree, but it's at the other end of the equation. It's not at the beginning. And what we can do is by artificially, you know, if I say, oh, Maria and Simon are different because they're different ages, different genders, different nationalities. So they're bound to be different. That might not be the case because, you know, I might be like you, Maria. I might be a planner. I might kind of like to know all the things that you like to know. So I'm quite similar to you in that respect, for example. But... If I assume that you're different, then this is where it impacts your marketing, it, imp it impacts your loyalty schemes, it impacts your subscriptions, because I've artificially assumed that you are different to me, but at, at a deep psychological level, you might not be. So I'm actually making things much more complicated than I need them to be. And often our work is about going into companies and they say, I've got 16 personas. And you can see the communications person almost like crying into their hands because they're like, how do I communicate to 16 different groups? I can't do it. And we go in and go, actually, you've only got three groups at a psychology level because these five groups go into this one, these three mm -hmm. go into this one, and they all respond to a very similar psycholo psychological message. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, we came to an end. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us today? No, I don't think so. I think in terms of the sort of how do you get this stuff, a lot of clients go, I never knew you could do this. I never knew you could add it on. And I always thought it was an alternative. And I think just to think about it in a different way, there are people out there, I mean, like ourselves, there are other people out there who, who will come in and help out organizations move beyond just that static rear, rear view data and probably can help you clean it up and ask the right questions really but they are out there and hopefully you know by listening to things like that you can be encouraged to go well i can go out and i can find these people who can help me um but i would i would try and urge people not to just use that static data stuff because mm -hmm. uh, at best you're going to be you know when i talk to people i say well how was that marketing campaign how did it go and most people go yeah <laughs> it was all right but it could have been better. And that's an often a conversation I, I have with clients. And yet when you use the psychology, they, they, they literally go, oh, wow, that, I didn't know you could move the dial so quickly and for such a long period of time with the psychology. So it's having an open mind to think, look, you're trying to do your job. As a marketing person, you want to do the best job you can. Well, then use all the tools that you can and try and sort of think about how you can bring other things in to help your day-to-day -day job, really. Hmm. So if those people would want to get in contact with you, can they do it through LinkedIn or is there an email that we can give them? Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, on LinkedIn. Funny enough, there are about three psychologists called Simon Moore. What? 
I know. One's, one's a dentist who works in dentistry and looks at pain. Interesting. Anyway, but I, I'm the one with no hair and a beard, so I'm slightly more easy to distinguish from the others. Right. If you want to email me, which probably is easier, um, we've just changed our email, actually. But if you email me at simon at innovationbubble.eu, uh, you can usually get me on there. And that's probably the easiest way to get me because I check my emails quite regularly. Perfect. Well, so that's the end of today's show with Dr. Simon Moore. Thank you, Simon, for joining us. It has been a pleasure having you. Please make sure to tune in again to see and or to listen to the next Business Talk show, where we will be discussing more interesting topics with interesting people from all around the world. 